which is a webinar sponsored by the Florida Authors and Publishers Association. Uh, the purpose of these uh, webinars is so that you can figure out what to do after you type the end to your manuscript. So we're going to not waste any time. We have two very great speakers tonight uh, that are going to tell us a little bit about how to make your book business an actual business. I know we are all excited about writing and then we get to that point where what's next? Um, these two ladies tonight are going to tell us exactly what's next. Our first speaker, oh, by the way, just in case this is the first time that you've been doing this with us, we do um, have each of our speakers do their uh, presentations, and then we take questions and answers, well, take questions at the end of the both of them speaking. Um, you can add those questions in the chat if you are uh, so inclined so that we can get to those at the end. Um, or you can, if you don't think of it until we get to that part, you can raise either your virtual hand or your real hand. And uh, my lovely co-host, Pat Stamper, who you all probably know as the current president of the Florida Authors and Publishers. That is a beautiful face, Pat. And uh, she is going to help keep us on track as far as running all of the uh, behind the scenes gadgets. So she's going to keep track of the questions that come in and then we'll have our speakers answer those. And now I'm not. And hello, I'm back. Okay, so uh, everybody, if you would just mute yourselves, that would be awesome. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started because nobody came to listen to me speak tonight. Our very first speaker is Julia Demkowski. She has been in uh, the business world, explaining business to business. For 30 some years, she is most remarkably one of our speakers at BAPACON this year, which is exciting. Uh, what she's gonna talk about tonight is just a mere preview of all of the nuggets she's gonna drop for us um, at the conference. If you haven't signed up for the conference, uh, you can do that at myfapa.org. So Julia, if you'd like to take a moment or two to tell people a little bit more about yourself, and then go ahead and tell us the key steps to setting up our book business. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. And I so look forward to getting back out there in public, seeing people face to face. I'm really looking forward to the conference in July. Um, I get, my name is Julia Demkowski and I live in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I am currently in Aiken, South Carolina, at my friend's house. So my background is very boring because I'm in a bedroom because of the echoey sounds and everything. So um, thank you for allowing me to be mobile with this because I'm in town trying to help out my uh, parents. So just to show a hands, how many people on this call have set up a business entity? Awesome, okay, awesome. So there, there's just one or two that haven't. So for you, it may be, did I do this? Did I do that? Um, anytime I speak with solopreneurs or small business owners, I always have to start out with business planning versus a business plan. And many people don't do the business plan and many people do a business plan get a nice fancy document, goes on the shelf to collect dust. They never do anything with it. But the most important thing to that I convey to people is that every year you need to do business planning. And I always recommend that it is in November 
before Thanksgiving so that you can enjoy the holidays and be with your family and know what you're going to do um, come January 1. So business planning is just about what you want to accomplish in the next year and what, what went well last year and what didn't, how you're, gonna, how you're going to approach that. So um, I'll also throw out that I have an enormous amount of respect for those on this call because I um, have written my first book. It may be my only book, but it will be out this year. <laughs> so um, what a task, what a task. And, and all of those little things that, um, that you have to do to get the book ready to go to, to be published is, is amazing. So it's been a, a, a learning experience for me. So for those that haven't set up a business, um, that business planning step is really important because it can dictate some of the other little key steps that you may want to do when setting up the business. Um, obviously, the first, the first step is to think about, do you want to be a sole proprietor versus an LLC versus an LLC filing S? Um, and those are just for tax purposes. But I run across a lot of um, sole proprietors that they're commingling funds and it can, it can end up hurting you at tax time. And if you're super successful during that year, it can really hurt because of the, the taxes at the end of the year that you'll be required to pay. So if you haven't, um, if you haven't done the research, um, I looked it up, let me look at my note. It is um, Florida Department of State, myflorida.com, and you can get all kinds of information. The bottom line is, most states, it costs you $100 to set the business up, and it's $50 a year to stay current. And so that's not really that much. Um, while you're on the site, you will um, need to do a search. So what are you searching for? You're searching for the name. What are you going to name this business? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be a form of you? Um, lots of people, lots of authors will just incorporate their name. So you still have to search and make sure there's not too many Julia Demkowskis out there, but it's surprising how many Stanfords there were because that was the maiden name and the name of my company. So um, you can do all of that on the same website. So you want to make sure that you're looking at the, if you're selling out of state, that can be an issue. Um, you want to make sure that you're looking at when you're registering your business, you want to make sure that you're um, digging into the sales and use tax and the different townships, because I know you guys travel with book shows, so it, it can be different. So it's whatever state that you're incorporated in or that you're registered in that that website will give you that information while you're there. You want to make sure that you're checking the name. Um, if you're going to have, it's called distingu distinguishable, if your name is distinguishable, um, which is different than the fictitious name. So a fictitious name is if you're Julia Demkowski, but doing business as. Um, many uh, so um, small business owners will have a couple of different lines of business that they're doing under one entity. So those are some other things to keep in mind. If you, and, and this is, this is kind of where I'm at. How do I want to, how do I want to do the book? Because it, am I going to put it under Stanford or am I going to register Julia Demkowski? And I haven't really decided on that yet. Um, most important, you want to set up an EIN. And an EIN is your business, your business's social security number, basically. And you want to keep that separate. Um, it's, uh, you just go on to, go on to the website that I said, Florida, uh, myflorida.com, and all the links are there. I went and I checked into it just to make sure before I met with you guys tonight. Um, check into the licenses and the permits, making sure that wherever you're selling, everything is good. Depending on um, 
depending on how large the venues are, you want to make sure that you're looking at, at what kind of insurance coverage you have. If you're in individual booths versus in a um, convention space, that can make a difference. Um, and then once you set up the set the business up, you you want to start to think about and Tara probably is going to touch on this. Um, you want to be thinking about that branding. So some some folks will tell me that well it's my name. I'm not really going to do a logo, but you're but that's very important. And it, you can still use your name, but it's a color, it's a font, it's how it, it how it's positioned. Um, thinking about things, how it'll look on books or how it'll look on uh, stationery, how it'll look on business cards. Uh, it'll also depend on if you're going to have um, different profit centers, the way that you make money. Is it just selling books? Are you also speaking? Are you also coaching? Are you working with uh, clients doing ghostwriting? All of those things come into play when you're setting up the business, okay? Um, and then the, the, the last step, I mean, really, it's seven steps to open a legitimate business entity. And once you do all of those steps, then go to the bank and get that separate account, get that business account. And between the failing to plan, which is planning to fail, and setting up the EIN and getting that separate business account. Those are the really the top three things that um, I see that lots and lots of solopreneurs will fail to do. And you're going into this thinking that you're gonna be successful. It's either you have a pretty expensive hobby or you're interested in making money. And if you set things up correctly at the beginning and run it as a business, you're keeping everything separate. And at the end of the year, you're doing your taxes. If you're a LLC or an S, you're filling out a K-1. It goes on to your personal taxes. Everything is kept different. And we had lots and lots and lots and lots of clients that will be in Walmart. Ooh, I got to have this. And they use that personal credit card. And you, you really don't want to do that. You want to keep everything separate. Um, and that's really the, the, the basics. So I'm trying to watch my time there, Miss Stanford, to make sure that I'm staying at my 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so, and, and, and I guess we're gonna do questions uh, at the end. Is yeah. that right? Correct, yes. correct, yeah. Okay. Well, that, that was a lot of information in a very short period of time. So I'm sure that people are gonna have some questions. And remember that Julia, you guys remember that Julia is going to be speaking in depth. She's going to have about 90 minutes to talk at the conference and be able to go into a lot more um, in depth with each of those points that she was talking about. Um, so uh, one of the things, just if I can interject for just a moment. Um, one of the things I love most about FAPA and the reason that I have been a member since uh, 2014 is because of the networking and the connections that we get to make. And um, that is probably the number one reason I think that most of our, our members would say that they renew is because of those connections and showing up at the uh, conference, which we now call FAPACON. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this whole story is because one of my very favorite connections that I have made at FAPACON um, is with our next speaker, Tara Alamani, who um, has been a speaker a number of times for our organization. Uh, and that is because she is just such a wealth of knowledge about so many different um, topics. So I'm super excited that she is not speaking this year, unfortunately, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't see her again soon at, at something. Um, so uh, it is a great pleasure that I get to introduce one more time <laughs> Tara. She is a author, award-winning author, publisher, a publisher uh, and I believe if you were here earlier, you know that she is also a winemaker. 
So Tara, if you would like to take a couple minutes to tell people a little bit more about yourself and then talk to us about congratulations, you're in business. Thank you very much. Uh, and Patty, it's always wonderful having you introduce me. Princess Patty usually has her TRI. I see it's missing tonight, but I'm, I'm sure it's someplace nearby. <laughs> so I'm Tara Alamani. I'm the founder of Emerald Lake Books, and we've been in business since 2014 and um, have a catalog now of, of over 30 titles. So we're growing and, and uh, learning all the time. And this is kind of a, one of my favorite conversations to have with authors because oftentimes they have had a passion to write about something specific, whether it was a story they wanted to share or information they wanted to get out, get out there. And they're not really thinking beyond the writing process. And I usually you know, have to pop their little bubble and, and let them know that the easy part is done. The hard part's just getting ready to start, which is the, the marketing of it. And one of the things that you know, we'll talk about is the fact that when you have written a book, you have essentially gone into business. And I highly recommend setting up as a business, as Julia recommended. You have two choices. You can either treat it like a hobby, in which case the IRS will tax you as if it's a hobby and uh, you won't get to deduct your expenses for it and all that neat stuff. Or you can treat it like a business where actually if you do it right, you may actually be able to save yourself some money in, in taxes. So that's always uh, something to, to consider there. Um, I'm envious of how inexpensive it is to set up uh, this in, in Florida. It's much more expensive in Connecticut, uh, which is where I'm based out of. We have to do an annual report that has a filing fee of $86 a year. Our business entity taxes every two years is $350. And you also have to, of course, uh, file for a sales tax license. And that takes about eight weeks to get. So all of the things that you need to think about ahead of time. Um, but when we have this conversation with our authors, really, we have to convince them that they have a product. Their book is their product. If they're going to be both a speaker and an author, then their book is their product and they are a product. And they have to think about both of those in terms of how the branding is going to work. And are they only writing one book or will they write multiple books? Because you don't want to tie a brand too specifically to one book if you plan on writing more. So you have to think through all of those different things when it comes to your branding and how you're going to manage those. But as we start working on building that business entity and then the thoughts and concepts that go along with that, what's most important is to understand for each product you have, for each book that you've written, who is your ideal buyer for that? Who is the ideal reader? And so when you can understand who the ideal reader is, and dig deep into understanding what it is that they're looking for, then you have the opportunity to marry what you have to offer with what that specific buyer is looking for. So let me ask real quick, how many of you just by a show of hands write fiction? So a little more than half. And how, how many of you write nonfiction? Okay, so quite a few crossovers. Uh, so then what we'll do is kind of cover a little bit of both. So when you're writing nonfiction, typically you, what you want to be thinking about is how your book is solving a problem that a reader has. And when you're looking at what problem are they trying to solve? Why did they pick up your book? What attracted them to it? There's usually a pain point or something that they're trying to solve. If they've gone to the internet to do a search, there's three places that people will typically search for solutions to problems. They'll search on Google, they'll search on YouTube, and they'll search on Amazon. And so you want to make sure that when you are writing nonfiction books, that you are tying it into being findable on all three of those search engines. And the book gives you the opportunity to do that on Amazon. So as you're working on your book listing description, you wanna make sure that the keywords that people would be searching for a solution to that problem are part of your title or your subtitle. They're part of your keywords or categories and they're part of your listing description as well. So you wanna think through all of those different things to make your book as discoverable as possible. When you're writing fiction, you're going to do something similar, but now you're not addressing pain points, you're addressing interest, you're addressing what people are trying to find. So maybe they're looking for a cozy mystery, maybe they're looking for an enjoyable Saturday read. So kind of think through what it is that they might be looking for and make sure that once again, somewhere in your subtitle, your descriptions, your keywords, your tags, uh, that you have included those terms to improve the discoverability. 
And it's actually better to use longer terms than shorter ones because the shorter ones have a lot of competition. The longer ones may get searched for frequently, but they'll have fewer books that have used those keywords, the long tail keywords, which is usually when the keyword is three or four words long. And so you want to consider using those uh, to, to decrease the competition and increase the visibility for your books. So when you have looked at your book and you've considered who your ideal reader is, and you've made a bridge between what it is they're looking for and what you have to offer in your book, the other thing you want to be aware of is who your competition is. And, and you know, the, the challenge here becomes um, your competition isn't really the way you should be viewing them. You should be viewing them as who are your collaborators? Because the thing is, is that when somebody likes a specific genre, say they like a cozy mystery, they're not just going to read one cozy mystery. They're not going to find one author that they enjoy. They're going to read a variety of cozy mysteries. And so they're going to want to find a lot of authors that have that to author. So what you want to start doing is in organizations like this, building relationships with people who write in similar genres to yours, who share a similar audience. Because what you're going to be able to do then is collaborate in ways that allow you to promote one another. Uh, a sale of somebody who has a book similar to yours is not taking away from your books if they've already bought yours. You know, So being able to recommend somebody else actually increases the, the reader's perception of what you have to offer. It means that the perceived value is higher because not only are you promoting your own books all the time, but you are sharing other valuable resources. I frequently will tell people about Jane's book about, you know, getting into schools and, and schools being a niche market, because that's something that a lot of people who follow me are interested in learning more about. And there are not a lot of people who have written about that particular topic in a way that uh, is authoritative. And Jane's done that. So I have no issue with sharing her with my readers because they're looking for ways to increase the marketability of their book. And so when I can put out my newsletter on a regular basis, sharing these kind of resources that aren't just about me, but about what it is that they're looking for and they need, the, mm -hmm. the oppression of my business, of my book, of my brand is increased because I'm not just out there promoting myself. And so here you are now, you have your, your book, you have your product, you've built your bridge to your reader, you're thinking about who you're collaborators or competitors are, depending on how you want to view it, you want to understand those comparable titles to your book as well. You want to understand how they're positioned, what genres they're in, what shelf they're on, what books are next to them on the shelf. And you want to really dig into all of that, doing that what's called competitive research, mostly because it will help you figure out how to do your marketing better. So if you look at a comparable title to yours, somebody who's written about a similar subject, and you go through and you read their listing description, get an idea for how does it come across? Does it come across very professional? Does it come across as being disorganized? Is it neat and easy to read and informative? Or is it just a, a wall of text and you, your eye doesn't even know where to start? So look through that. You also want to go down to the reviews for each of those, book, each of those books and look through what readers have had to say about the books. Look at what they've said that's positive because those are the things that readers appreciated most about those books, but also look at what was said that was negative because it'll give you some ideas of things either to avoid or things that you might want to include that they missed out on an opportunity to include or things that you can improve on. So pay attention to those reviews because it will give you ideas for how to improve your own marketing in your own book. So in doing all of those different things, you've now put yourself in a position where you know what your market is, you know who your competition or potential collaborators are, you know who your readers are. Yep, Ginger points out you can find keywords in the reviews as well, and that's definitely true. You need to figure out how you're going to have a system that supports all of this now, because you have a business, you have a product, okay? Most businesses and products, they have a bookkeeping system. You know, how are they keeping track of sales? How are they keeping track of what taxes they have to pay? How are they keeping track of expenses that they have? So you want to make sure that you have some kind of bookkeeping system. Personally, I use QuickBooks Online and it's relatively easy to use, but there are a lot of you know, options out there. So look to see what makes sense for you. You want to consider as well how you're going to manage your email system. 
And so there are a bunch of different options out there for email management systems. But what I recommend doing is, is making sure that when you try to encourage people to sign up for your mailing list, that you're making sure that the opt-in that you're giving them, the opportunity to sign in, is something that's very valuable to them. So for instance, for us, we use quizzes. It's, it's a great way to incorporate something from a book that goes to a quiz where people can explore your specific topic more and get customized information related to what they can do and next steps they can take based on where they're currently at. And so that can be a great thing. Uh, you want to think about right now, opt-ins that are interactive are much better for increasing conversion rates, which means getting somebody to actually sign up for your mailing list than options that are static. So if you think about going to somebody's website and it just says, join my mailing list, but it doesn't give a reason, you're not going to get many people to join that mailing list. It's about a one, one to 2% conversion rate. If you have an opt-in saying, join my mailing list and I'll send you a, a white paper or I'll send you an excerpt of my next book or I'll send you a free novella, you may get a good conversion rate on that is something like 10%. Uh, you may get about 10% of the people who see that to, to actually sign up. If you have something that's interactive, like a quiz, you actually, right now, the, the current conversion rate for quizzes is about 24%. Uh, about 24% of the people who see the quiz, take the quiz, will sign up for your mailing list as well. And they're very engaged because they want to learn more about what you've already started to teach them through the quiz. So it's a fun way to kind of build, build your mailing list. When you do get somebody onto your mailing list, you want to make sure that you have some kind of nurture sequence that follows along with that. And what a nurture sequence typically is, is just a series of short emails that go out over the course of the next week or two that tell them a bit, you know, welcome them to the list, deliver whatever it is that you offered them, make sure that you are setting expectations in terms of letting them know how frequently you're going to write to them, what they can expect to see in your news newsletter, why you encourage them to stay on the newsletter and not unsubscribe right after they've gotten your free whatever. Uh, so, you know, use that as an opportunity and send out two, three, four emails over the course of the next one, two, three weeks that's just keeping in touch with them. And actually what we do with our nurture sequence is those emails are actually video emails. So I will send a video welcome message uh, for some of the opt-ins that we have so that not only are they reading what I have to say, but they're also getting this face-to-face -face time as well. So they feel like they get to know me. I will also end every single one of those emails with some kind of question that I ask them to reply back to me for. And the reason is it gives the opportunity for us to engage in conversation and get to know one another better. Because when people feel like they know the person whose list they're on, then they're, it's, it's, it's like, you know, me, me talking to Patty. You know, I, I have no issue with talking to Patty if she, you know, sends me an email or whatever. So when somebody is, is engaging in conversation back and forth with their mailing list, it builds this loyalty factor. And so now as I continue to provide value through my emails, I'm going to eventually end up with, with ambassadors, people who are going to go out and tell other people about my book, my product, my mailing list, my service, whatever it might be. So those are all some of the things that you want to think through. And obviously I can talk a long time about this. Um, I'm going to probably end right here so that people can ask questions of both Julie and I. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara. See, I told you guys, wealth of uh, information. Um, so I think we did have a couple of questions that came in. Um, Pat, did you want to ask them? You want me to ask them? Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to, given that opportunity, I'm going to abuse my, uh, power for a moment and ask Tara, what mail, um, what, uh, mail service do you use for your email list to keep track of your email list? So mine is not what I would recommend starting out people to use. I'm using Infusionsoft, which is called Keep. Uh, the reason I'm using it is because it's, it's very powerful. There's a lot of different things that it allows you to do. What I will do, though, is I will drop a link in the chat. Uh, Kindlepreneur, which is a website that I highly recommend, has a review of four of the most common email services used for authors. And there is one in particular that stands out as being the best. And I always forget, but I think it's MailerLite, but I will pull up the article and drop it in the chat so people can take a look at it. Okay, thank you. Now I'll get to somebody else's questions. 
Um, oh wait, Bruce just popped up with one for Julia. And this is why I don't read, okay. And it is, can you make a brief checklist of your recommendations or, uh, or a bullet list of your recommendations for yeah. what first? You got it? You got this, Julia? Or do you want me to send it to um, Patty or Pat to Patty and Pat? That's funny. Um, I know. We're trying to get Renee Garrison to change her name to Patsy or something just to keep the flow. But she, so far, she, she's only willing to be known as Renee. But uh, Patsy. <laughs> Yes, I'm happy to send that out. I'll, I'll send it to, is it okay? Pat, I send it to Pat and she can forward it to you guys. Yeah, actually, actually what we- what Maybe we materials can... for when we actually have the presentation. Mm -hmm. That Whoever signed up gets the materials. Yeah. So I don't know how can... to get Tara's fire hose to fit into a list. But <laughs> I just remember the picture from two years ago of the little girl in the hose and being like, okay, that's Tara. One of, one of the things that Peppa can do for our uh, members is that we can take, when we have speakers like this, we can take any materials um, that they wanted to share and we make that a member uh, perk. We can make it so it's downloadable from your, FAPA, um, from your FAPA account. So you would log into the website and get it from your account page, any of the downloads. There's a couple of them in there already, but anything that Tara or Julia want to send to share with you, we can, we can certainly do it that way. That's a, that's a pretty good idea. Um, Ginger I think you had the recording to go on. <laughs> yeah, we, we got that. Um, Ginger wants to know how important is it to have a CMS for an author? Tara? Yeah, I so guess a, C a CMS is a content management system, which is typically some form of a, a website, typically. Uh, so, you know, I do recommend that all authors have a website, uh, if not a website of their own, that they at least make sure that they have a web page on their author, on, on their publisher's site. Uh, so for every single one of our authors, we provide a page specific to that author that includes their bio and a contact form for them. Uh, but WordPress is one of the most popular content management systems out there. And uh, I do highly recommend using WordPress as my favorite. Um, there are a lot of them that are templated like uh, Wix and Weebly and, and GoDaddy's websites. I tend not to recommend them as much because they're not as good with SEO and because there's not a lot of flexibility in terms of what you want to do with them. So they tend not to grow with you. And so you wanna be very clear about what capability those templated websites have if you choose to use one of them. WordPress is more of a learning curve. And you know, if you're not techie, you're going to want some support using it, but there's so much that you can do with it that uh, I, I, for me, I think it's, uh, it's a very powerful tool. Thank you for that. And as you all, if you've ever seen uh, Tara speak, uh, she speaks techie very fluently. So, uh, <laughs> She's my go-to uh, when I go, wait, I don't get it. Um, so if she's recommending something that's not techie, it's probably very, uh, a lot easier for us to use. Um, Julia, uh, what would you say is the most um, uh, important reason to set, uh, set, you, set yourself up as a business versus just kind of winging it? Like what's, what's the most important reason? So you really wanna find that identity and through finding the identity that you are putting out there, that's going to give you get you closer to setting that branding. And it depends on, I mean, lots of people just want to write a book, but do you want to be a business or do you want to be a, um, do you want to support your hobby or do you want to become a business? And the, I, I saw in here, one of the questions is what, what, do, uh, what would authors uh, want to put in a business plan? And so it's, you know, the stuff that we talked about earlier was just getting, getting that business entity set up, putting you in position to where now you have a legitimate business to move forward. The thing that I think is most important that we didn't cover comes after that you're getting into your planning and monitoring, managing a budget is 
setting up how you are going to track expenses. You can do it with a ledger. You can do it manual. You can do it on Excel. I don't recommend it. I recommend uh, using QuickBooks. And again, the second part to that recommendation is if you don't have an accounting background and you don't like numbers, which lots of people don't, that's, uh, you know, I'm a geek when it comes to that. But if you set up QuickBooks wrong or try to use their little templates, you can get into trouble and any mistake can snowball. So it'll, it'll just keep getting bigger and bigger and it's much less expensive to go ahead and have somebody set it up right. And so you're looking for a person that wants to understand what your business is. Are you, are you writing, selling books like, like Tara said, you're the product. So, you know, for, for my own business, it's different services or it's speaking or it's consulting or coaching. So those are what we call profit centers. What areas in the business are you charging for and receiving income? And if you, if you mix this up and, and, and then you don't know when, when you're um, coding revenue and you're putting it to the wrong place, not only can it get your books mixed up, but then you're also not able to go back next year and say, okay, what was working? Where are my profit margins? Where am I spending my time? What is my return on investment on that time? And that's really, really important going forward into the next year. So there's a lot of moving parts and that's why the business planning step is so important because you really do need to look at this as, you know, what am I trying to accomplish? Who do I want to get in front of? When you, when you know who you're trying to reach and the problem that you're solving or the interest that you're addressing, then that also gives you the opportunity to know, well, where do these people hang out? That's where I want to be. So that, that helps you in advertising and helps you with where do you want to try to find speaking engagements or what kind of associations do you wanna be involved in? Um, I work with small and mid-sized businesses on the business side of business. So, you know, there's that right, perfect fit that you can be um, placing yourself in front of, right? So I know, you know, if, you, if it's fiction or nonfiction, how, how, you, how you identify the people that are most likely going to be interested in, in purchasing your book. So I, I kind of went that whole roundabout way, but bringing it all back to planning and understanding what you are trying to accomplish. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I'm just a, I'm just a sole proprietor, or I'm just a small business, or I'm just this, or I'm just that. And I always go back to when my son was born and uh, we moved to Virginia and I started going back to school. I, that's when I got my um, uh, MBA is when I, and I stayed home with him. And so I was a member of a um, Mothers of Preschoolers. It was part of, it was a program in a church. And there was a young lady that had a, a child, husband was military and they couldn't afford, they were in Virginia, they could not afford to go back to Texas to visit family. And so she was trying to figure out what she could do. And I said to her one day, what do you enjoy doing the most? And oh my God, she said, ironing. That blew my mind. But we created a small business for her. And she was flying back to Texas two and three times a month just for fun. And then she was there for, um, you know, for holidays and stuff. So it's not about how much revenue it is. It's about how you're planning, how you're managing, how you're, you know, what, what costs can you legally write off? You know, have you thought about all the things that you do when you go out of town? It, there's booth rental, there's the sales that you do, there's entertaining that, that can be part of what you can claim as business expenses. So there's a lot of that part that folks don't really think about. And if you're, you know, if you have a home office, you know, what, what can you write off there? You have to be careful with that. But 
if you have a home office and you're using that office to work, it isn't a legitimate write-off. So, you know, you have to look at what kind of entity you are and, and make sure to get on that state website because I, I work with people all over the country and all the states are different. So, you know, I always check, make sure that the state has that website where all of that information is available. And it isn't, it isn't hard. It's not very hard. So, you know, you don't have to be a multi-million dollar business. It's whatever you want. And if you have identified, you know, through, through the year, this kind of comes back to that business planning. Let's say that you went to a book fair, book show that was eight hours away. And, you know, so obviously the costs are more, right? Cost you more to go. Maybe you stay in a hotel, the gas, the food, everything that's involved. Um, and you sold a ton of books. It could be that that, you know, ends up being another place that you want to go back or not. So if you're right. tracking your numbers, then you would know. Right. I think I think um, uh, in in listening to you talk, I think that part of the problem is is that uh, as authors, we um, we the business part takes a lot of the romance out of the whole out of the whole thing, and and so I think I appreciate you uh, trying to get us to focus on the actual business part of it. Pat, did you have a question? Yeah, I I, I think we will get this out of the way. Tara, what is your microphone? <laughs> We all want it. <laughs> it's an it's an audio technica. I would have to look up the model number. I can drop oh, it in the. That's okay. <laughs> but I I did want to respond to Richard's uh, comment in the chat because in here he talks about you know the 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 uh, he's written a lot of books, made so little on Amazon that he doesn't see the point of starting up a business. And so I kind of want to just address that and, and tag a team a little bit with what Julia was talking about. Um, one of the things when you are writing and you're using it as hobby income instead of as a business is that when you are earning money from your books, you have to report that as earned income on your taxes, but you don't have the benefit of deducting the expenses that go along with that. So all you're doing is ending up in a situation where you are potentially being taxed more money on this hobby income that comes in. When you are using your book as part of a business and you've established a business and you're writing this out on a Schedule C or a K-1, depending on how you've got it set up, what you're allowed to do then is offset your earnings with your expenses. So say you're doing Amazon advertising or you run an ad in the FAPA uh, annual conference flyer, uh, any of these different things that you may doing, be doing, they are used to deduct or to reduce your earned income from your from your books, and then you're only paid on the difference, or you're only paying taxes on the difference. So one is you're paying taxes on the full amount. The other is you can use your expenses to reduce. And in some way, some situations, if you've managed to lose money, you've spent more on expenses than you've earned. You're actually reducing your overall taxable income, so income you have from other sources as well. So there's a lot of good reasons for treating it like a business rather than a hobby, because in the end, financially, you can be significantly better off with when it comes to taxes. You'd have to talk to your tax accountant about how to do that. But I highly recommend if you are interested in selling books long-term in any way, shape or form, setting it up as a business. So oh. somebody asked um, in the chat, do you do a different profit and loss account for each book? The profit and loss is a financial statement. You have a profit and loss and a um, balance sheet. And so on the profit and loss, you have what I was talking about earlier, profit centers, the, the um, account names that uh, where you are receiving income. It could be speaking, it could be selling books, it could be any activity that you're doing that you receive income for. And so all of that goes on to one profit and loss. The only reason that you would have two profit and loss statements is with two different companies. And then another question was about using online QuickBooks. Um, yeah, I like standalone better. There's a lot of different reports that you can do. Uh, it's my opinion. 
And that's, and that's just it, is an opinion. A lot of people love the online, um, but you can still share if you have, uh, if you're working with an accountant, you can export into adequate books, any Excel document and send to your accountant if you need to. So I think that, was there another one? I, I, I had a, a, a question. What do you think and this is open to both of you. What do you think in this past year? Um, I, I think I think that the biggest challenge that we had was how to pivot with the fact that so many authors uh, rely on doing um, in-person kind of uh, book sales. Um, so, what do you think? Do you do you think it was easier or harder? Uh, for for people to pivot if their businesses were set up better and what maybe was the was the one thing that maybe made a difference did that did that question make sense Good. Tara's looking at, Tara's uh, looking at me like I'll no that did not make any sense Patty <laughs> I'll take that I, and you can tell me if I veered too far to the left or right but I work with all industries and every single industry has had to pivot Every sure. single one. And, and currently, a lot of small businesses are, are really suffering because people can make more on unemployment. And so they're having trouble hiring people. So I, I think in some, in some ways, it's, it's forced people to pivot and think of other ways. So if you're a creative mind, you can figure out, well, wait a minute. Okay, so it's, I, I, I do have a writer, she doesn't write books, um, that started writing blogs for people. So it was, she, she writes medical books, medical stuff for doctors, um, um, brochures and, and a little bit of marketing, but mostly taking that technical information and making it easy to understand for patients that have different different challenges going on. But so she started writing blogs and then through the blogs, she discovered that, well, wait a minute, ghostwriting is interesting. And so now she's, she's doing better than ever. So it's, it's really whenever we have these kind of things, it's when you have to start figuring out, okay, how am I gonna make money? Sometimes there's those silver linings. Um, it's obviously given people a lot of things to write about because of all the changes that we've had in 2020. I mean, we, you know, we can all pick up and go to another state and still attend a webinar. So it's, it's really provided the challenges, of course, but also forced us to think outside the box. Yeah, and I found from my standpoint that, you know, definitely pivoting has made people have to get outside their comfort zones. We have certain things that we're used to doing and we think that's the most effective thing. And so we do that repeatedly. And as a result, we're not thinking outside the box about how to market our business, how to collaborate with others that share our audience. And so this has really forced people to, to think more about how to do that. I think those that are more technically inclined are the ones that are benefiting the most in terms of the authors who can figure out how to do bigger things, different things, whether it's doing webinars or participating in, in virtual conferences. I know uh, in 2019, when my book published with purpose, I'm pointing behind me, when my book published with purpose came out, um, you know, it came out in April, the audiobook came out in June, and then in October, I did a huge virtual conference around it where I had 450 attendees. Uh, so, you know, being able to take your content and find other ways to use it, to generate attention, to attract people to it. Uh, I know the virtual arena right now, I mean, this year I've spoken 12 times and I haven't had to leave my dining room to do that. Uh, you know, I couldn't do that before the pandemic because everyone would want me to travel to where they were. And so I think when you're able to embrace the technology that's available to you and figure out how to marry what you have in your book to share with readers in ways that can be done online, whether that's through podcasts or uh, coaching calls or webinars or virtual summits, um, there's a lot of opportunity there. And do you think that it was easier if you had already set up a, a solid business base rather than maybe doing the hobby thing on the side? No, because the best thing you can do in any business, but especially when you're an author, 
is leverage other people's audiences. It's not about having a pre-existing audience of your own. It's about finding who already has an audience that you want to get in front of. And when you can then build a relationship with that one individual and make it something that's valuable to both of you and demonstrate that you have something worthwhile to share with their followers and that you're going to take good care of them, you know, those followers, that's, that's, that's great because now suddenly you have the opportunity to attract a lot more followers than you had previously. That makes sense. I appreciate that. Another point, Patty, is that, you know, setting up the business, setting up the entity is not going to make you a better writer or all of a sudden you, you, you can't put two words together. It's a structural thing of your business. It's a, it's a basic, you know, just a basic business thing is to just get the business set up. The more important part is what you do after that. And when you start to treat it like a business, just like the gal that did ironing, you know, when she started treating, I mean, who likes to do ironing? She ironed sheets for goodness sake. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and, and that's what she, she play with, you know, her son and everything. So, I mean, I, I, I've had friends that started side businesses. There are multi-million dollar companies that started in garages and, and they start thinking of this as a business. And so the, 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 the process of setting it up as a business is a mindset in addition to the legal part and the tax part. I don't do law and I don't do taxes, but I'm going to tell you, it's not when, it's not if you need an accountant, it's when, right? Because there's so many different tax laws, um, but it's that mindset this is my business. And you writers write from a passion. It comes from a place of love of writing, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have something of something of importance to say or a story to tell. And, you know, make it a living, make it your job, make it a career. You might as well make money. And if you, if you don't treat it as a business, you might be surprised at how much, because how many how many books do you have to sell in order to break even on what you what you invested in editors and and publishers? You know, it's it's not cheap, right? So, how many books do you need to sell? Are you going to write another book? What's the you know investing the money to um, to to get that return on on um, investment is obviously a good thing, uh, but folks, what I find folks don't really think about that part, you know, right. it, it's right. their hobby, but if you enjoy doing it, then it doesn't feel like work. Right. Well, I always try and tell authors when they're new that it, it was your baby until you typed the end. And then now it has to be a product and you have to have people around you tell you that your baby's ugly and help you fix it. And then you got to sell your baby. So yeah. <laughs> It's got to, at some point, it's got to be, got to become a, a business for sure. To hundreds and thousands else? of people. <laughs> <laughs> if you Did don't... anybody else have a question or any, any final thoughts that, uh, uh, that either of you want to share? Well, I see that Sam had asked about um, yeah. using a tax accountant or a tax preparer. Personally, I use my bookkeeper. Uh, my bookkeeper has enough experience to know how to set up my QuickBooks so that uh, everything set up well to transition into doing my taxes. Uh, and so that's who I used. Yeah, it, you know, the 1120 S is really very, it's, it, it's, it's a lot easier than you think. Um, it's a lot easier than your personal taxes. Um, if you get into, you know, multi-million dollar business and you've got lots of employees and you've got all of these moving parts, then you really need to get with a CPA because they're going to, they're going to put you in better shape because they keep up with the tax laws, but your bookkeeper should be able to help you accomplish what you need to accomplish. But just, you know, if, if you, I tell clients marketing is not my first language, but I know what the return on investment is. And if you don't, if people don't know you exist or don't know about your product, they won't buy it. And so that is, that is a key expense 
and it's worth it, quite frankly. Right. Well, I think that was a lot of information. I think uh, everybody has a lot to think about. <laughs> and, uh, I know that I'm, I'm guilty too of, of not keeping track of some of the things that I should. And my husband's very numbers oriented. So when he asks, you know, how much does a book cost? And I tell him it costs me this. And he says, with, you know, with the shipping to the, you know, to the house. And I'm like, oh no, that's gotta be this, and, you know? You, and you, after a while, you kind of get used to it and you just keep track of that stuff. But it, it's, it's not, like you guys said, it's, it's not necessarily first, uh, first of, you know, top of mind for a lot of creative people. We, we want to create things because it's fun. And then the business part is way less fun. Um, but I think you're right with what Julia said. If, you, if you've got a plan um, and, it, and you're keeping the data, it does make it a little bit easier. And um, so, yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I'm going to remind everybody that, again, that the uh, FAPA Con 2021 registration is open. Uh, you can go to myfapa.org and register for that. Uh, next month, our practical tips is going to include uh, our very own Ginger Marks, who's going to talk about your book's interior design. And Elizabeth Babsky is going to talk about the importance of a good cover design. Uh, if you wish to attend those, you can email Pat. Uh, our FAPA president at patstanford at myfapa.org. And please put practical tips in the subject line. She gets a bunch of email. It helps keep her straight. Uh, and if there's anything we need, it's for Pat to keep things straight. Um, and uh, again, just thank you guys for joining us. I hope you got some value out of this. Uh, I'm sure that you will see Julia at the conference and I'm sure that you will see Tara somewhere because she is everywhere. Um, <laughs> thanks everybody for joining us and we will see you next month. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have all. Thank you. Tara.